My name is Jack Holder. I'm a 97-year-old World War II Navy veteran, Pearl Harbor survivor. I was born in a small town by the name of Gunner, 15 miles from Dallas, but I grew up in a small town 56 miles south of Wichita Falls. Life was very primitive there. My father was a farmer. We lived in a shack that my father built. No electricity, no running water, no telephone, no bathtub. Uh, we had an outside toilet and a Sears and Roebuck catalog for toilet paper. I walked a mile and a half to school till I finished the eighth grade. For you that don't, not familiar with it, farming back in those days was a very rough, rough life. Lots of work, very little money. And if you can imagine this, gasoline was 15 cents a gallon. A day's work you usually netted you at one dollar. One year I drove a tractor and pulled my neighbor's combine. Me and the tractor together made two dollars and fifty cents a day. When I started high school, I was transported to a small town by the name of Newcastle in a 1927 green Model A Ford truck. Wooden benches down each side for, for seats. Canvas on the sides of the truck to protect you from the weather. And you can imagine how cold it was during the winter months. I soon realized that farming was not gonna consume my life. April 1924, fresh out of high school, 18 years old, I joined the Navy. Boarded a train in Dallas, made the trip to San Diego to boot camp training. I got sick on the way, but when I got to the Naval Training Station, it was examined by the doctor. My, prior, my last job prior to joining the Navy was that I was cutting prickly pears with a long handle shovel, piling the pears so they could dry, burn them so the cattle couldn't eat them. I had calluses on my hands you couldn't believe. The doctor looked at them and he said, what in the world have you been doing? He then told me I had appendicitis. I went to the Naval Hospital and spent one month. Following that, I entered boot camp training for two months. Boot camp can be very strenuous, but it's certainly necessary. It teaches discipline. It turns a boy into a man. Very strict rules on the, your clothes that you wore all day and washed that evening. Hang them up on the line. They better be hang, hung right or you'll pay for it the next day. I only made one mistake. Finishing boot camp training, I then went to the aviation machinist mate school for another four months. My mother had a brother who was a pilot, and I, I, I got intrigued by that. I always wanted to fly then. That's the reason I entered the school. December the 6th, 1940, I was aboard the U.S. Platte, a Navy tanker loaded with six million gallons of fuel oil headed for Pearl Harbor. We arrived at Pearl on the 12th. I was immediately transported to and assigned to a, a PBY squadron, VP-23 on Fort Island. 
This is a PBY, strictly a flying boat. Has no landing gear, permanent landing gear. And you install beaching gear, bring it ashore, roll it back in the water, take the beaching gear off prior to, to uh, flight. Enlisted men in the Navy, a young recruit, normally has to serve some time as a mess cook. Mess cook is exactly what it is. You clean up the mess, it's a cook mix. I never had to go to mess cook, but I've served four months in the beach crew. Following the four months, I was assigned to a, a plane uh, crew as the first mechanic and a waist hatch gunner. Four months later, I became a plane captain, which is uh, in the Navy. The flight engineer in the Navy is called a plane captain. Duty in Hawaii at that time, prior to December the 7th, was very nice. You can imagine what it was to a farm, Texas farm boy to see all the beauty in Hawaii. But Yamamoto changed all that. I had the duty that day which means you stay aboard, stay aboard and stand watch. My section had just fell in for muster. When the section leader began roll call, we heard a screaming aircraft. We thought at first it was one of our own. Moments later, we heard a terrible explosion. We ran outside. The first bomb that fell in Pearl Harbor hit the hangar next to mine. All of our aircraft, this aircraft, they were only two weeks old. We just returned from San Diego with brand new aircraft. Half of them were on fire. We seen the planes overhead with the rising sun insignia. We knew exactly what had happened. One of my shipmates remembered there was a sewer line behind our hangar under construction. He says, let's go for the ditch, follow me. We all ran, jumped in the ditch, sat there clinging to each other. And I've been asked a lot of times, I guess, uh, what my thoughts were at that time. The one that I can vividly remember is God don't let me die in this ditch. One of the, one of the uh, Japanese pilots seen us in the ditch, strafed the ditch with machine gun fire, missing us by two or three feet. He hit the dirt piled up beside the ditch. This was a two wave attack, of course. When the first wave was over, we were out of the ditch. We started separating aircraft that were damaged from those that weren't damaged. I was directed by the leading chief to get the commanding officer's aircraft ready for flight. It was in the hangar doing, undergoing a 30-hour check. I grabbed two other shipmates. We helped get the plane ready to roll out. It was rolled out, filled with fuel, loaded with two 1,000-pound bombs. The commanding officer and his crew flew for 19 hours looking for the Japanese fleet, but found nothing. Late in the afternoon, martial law was declared, a complete blackout over the Solomon, over, over the Hawaiian Islands. And machine gun pits constructed from sandbags had been set up around, all around Fort Island. Two shipmates and I had the pleasure of occupying one of them for three days and nights. We had no idea where the Japanese fleet was or if they planned to return, but every ship's noise or aircraft noise we heard, we knew it had to be them. Fortunately, that didn't happen. 
On the fourth day, we were allowed to return to our barracks. All lockers had been broken open to retrieve white clothing for bandages. And at that time, we were each given a postcard with two inscriptions inscribed. The first one says, I'm okay. The first one says, the first one says, I've been wounded. The second one says, I'm okay, don't worry. My mother received this card 11 days later. Later, when I seen my father, he said my mother was hysterical at the time. She got on her knees and prayed to God if he, he would save her son. She spent the rest of her life working for the church, and she did. Shortly after this, we resumed all the duties that uh, we, we had prior to the raid, flying patrol around the Hawaiian Islands. But uh, following the Jimmy Doolittle raid in Tokyo, naval intelligence began receiving a lot of coded messages using the letters AO and AF. We had broken the Japanese code to a point. They knew that what, what they stood for, the Dutch, the uh, Lucian Islands, and Midway, but they couldn't tell which one was which. Chief of Intelligence told Admiral Nimitz, says, I've devised a plan to ascertain what they mean. We'll send out an uncoded message saying, Midway has just had a freshwater condenser failure. The Japanese took the bait. They sent out a coded message that says, AF has just had a freshwater condenser failure. We then knew, but we didn't know which one that they planned to attack. In disguise, Admiral Nimitz sent a small task force to the Aleutians, and he dispatched the rest of the fleet to Midway, positioning the carriers in one, one location, the rest of the fleet in another. My squadron, VP-23, and another left Pearl Harbor on May 28, 1942, headed for Midway. I happened to be in the second aircraft that spotted the Japanese fleet coming to Midway, 450 miles away, headed towards Midway under a weather front. On June 4, they struck, struck Midway. Midway was protected at that time by the Marines who had 27 Brewster Buffalo fighters. They sent 27 aloft and only seven returned and they were unflyable then. For the first two hours, we were definitely losing the battle. The Hornet launched 30 Torpedo planes, only one man returned. They then launched 15 more, and only four of those returned. 45 aircraft, we lost 40. But that was a time when the tide was about to turn. We had airborne three squadrons of dive bombers, led by Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey, They've been airborne for two hours, running low on fuel, but he says we're going to press on just a little longer. Moments later, he seen the white wake of a fast-moving destroyer, and he says that ship has to be racing to join the main fleet. We'll follow it. And just moments later again, they spotted three aircraft carriers. Diving from 20,000 feet, they sunk all three in four minutes. They were aided by two factors. Admiral Nagumo, the admiral in charge of the aviation fleet, 
had received word that damage to Midway was slight. He says, we'll rearm with bombs and we'll go back to Midway. Admiral Yamamoto says, no, we'll rearm with torpedoes and go after their fleet. While they were changing, while they, while they were rearming, and also uh, Japanese fighters were at low altitude protecting their own fleet from our torpedo planes. That was the moment when, we, when all of our dive bombers struck. A little later, Admiral Spruance called Admiral Lemons and he said, Admiral, we've had a good day. We just sunk three aircraft carriers. Do you think that's enough? He says, no, I want the fourth carrier. Shortly after that, the other carrier was found, the fourth carrier was found, it was also sunk. They came to Midway with four carriers and left with none. The following day, oh, to any rate, I was airborne at four o'clock that morning carrying four 500 pound bombs. We flew 13 hours. Early afternoon, we found a Japanese sunk sub uh, attempting to submerge. All hatches were closed, no one was on deck. We dropped two bombs. We're first one on the fan tail, the second right behind the conning tower. We made six circles around it watching it sink. We had a good day. Late in the afternoon, we had lost all contact, radio contact with Midway. We didn't know if we still controlled the island or the Japanese had it. We had an option. We could take a chance on returning to Midway or we could sit down at sea. We dropped our two remaining bombs unarmed, sat down at sea and drifted all night. I took a sleeping bag, climbed on top of the top of the wing. And if you can see this, there's a little an radio antenna right here. I tied myself to the antenna, spent the night. Sun up the next day, we finally made contact with Midway. We learned that we had been successful. We were also told there was a destroyer that the French frigate shows loaded with aviation fuel. We took navigational sunshots, flew to the islands, refuel, went to Midway. The next day, all search planes were looking for downed seamen. Late in the afternoon, we found two gentlemen in a, in a life raft, but we were low on fuel at the time. We radioed a sister ship, they landed, picked up the two gentlemen and took them to Midway. Following day, we returned to Pearl Harbor. Had five glorious days at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, but that was short lived. July the 1st, I was on my way to Guadalcanal our first location, we were stationed in the bay at New Maya, New Caledonia. Begin our search, we begin the patrol over Guadalcanal and all the Solomon Islands. At that time, Admiral Gormley was in charge of all the forces at Guadalcanal. He had never even been on the island. We first two months there, we were definitely losing that battle. He was immediately relieved by Admiral Halsey. Halsey came aboard, immediately transferred our my squadron VP-23 to Espirito Santo, which is 300 miles closer to Guadalcanal. He then visited the island, visited every unit on the island, and he says, we'll no longer allow the Japanese to call the shots. He says, we'll kill every one of them here and I'll be right with you. I 
I flew 38 missions over the island. And things were finally going our way there. In early 43, I received orders to travel to San Diego, supposedly to help commission a new PBY squadron. When I reached there, my orders had been changed. I started training in the B-24 Liberator. I was in the first squadron of B-24s commissioned by the Navy, BB-103. We spent two months in San Diego training, moved to Argentina, Newfoundland for another two months. April 1943, I was in Dunkswell, Devonshire, England, where I flew 56 missions over the English Channel. We, managed, we had uh, five squadrons of Navy B-24s there, flew 3,664 missions over the channel, sunk eight submarines, and damaged four more. My crew managed to get one of them. That was the end of my conflict. In, the, in late June of 1944, I was transferred to Chincoteague, Virginia, again to help commission a new uh, squadron of B-24s. But the war was dwindling down at that time. The squadron was never commissioned. I spent a year there and was transferred to Patuxent River, or to uh, uh, Jackson, Pensacola, Florida, sorry. Spent a year there and then was transferred to Patuxent River, Maryland for one more year. April 1948, I was discharged with an honorable discharge. I immediately went to work for Braniff Airways in Dallas. Received my, went to school, received my civilian Flight engineer's rating. Nineteen fifty, I transferred, uh, moved to uh, Los Angeles. Went to work for Northrop Aircraft. The third month I was there, I looked across the runway and I seen two Braniff aircraft. Still had the insignia of Braniff on the tail. I said, I've got to go over and find out what that is, what's, what's going on. I did. I met the owner of the airline. I was immediately hired as a flight engineer. Spent eight years there as a, as a flight engineer, but I had also had to go to school, get my pilot's license and my insur in, uh, instrument rating so I could double as co-pilot. I was a co-pilot there for eight years. One Sunday morning, the owner's secretary called me. She says, well, Jack, we've got to look for a job. But Kurt just sold all the aircraft. I immediately went to work for Union Oil Company of California as a corporate pilot. Spent 10 years with them as a captain and my wife at that time wanted me to quit flying. I went to work for Allied Signal, who is now Honeywell, spent 20 years there. 1991, I retired and spent the rest of the time on the golf course. Thank you. Jack was talking about the submarines he sank. During the war, submarines were trained that once the crew was below decks, 
in 30 seconds, that submarine was underwater. So in those 30 seconds, they found it, closed on it, and were able to sink it in 30 seconds. That's not very long. And also, during the, the course of the entire war, the Navy <coughs> issued only about 2,000 distinguished flying crosses. Jack has two of them. He also has a citation signed by FDR. So, do we have any questions? What was the 